Good afternoon and welcome to today's episode of Brain Matters. The brain as a network, good or bad. Um, I will moderate uh, the session and the presenters will be uh, Borana Dolomaya, Pierpaolo Sorrentino, Giovanni Rabuffo. Um, important to uh, um, note that the questions uh, have to be posted via the question and answer button that you find in your uh, uh, Zoom uh, menu. And all the questions will be answered at the end of uh, the today's session um, in series, in sequence. So please remember that. Um, um, we can start. And uh, I uh, briefly introduce myself. I'm Egidio D'Angelo. Uh, I uh, work on uh, uh, brain physiology and brain modeling. And I'm part of the Human Brain Project and the eBrains. Um, the point that we want to make today is about uh, the importance and the goodness of uh, making networks and models of networks of the brain. And in order to uh, confront ourselves with this uh, important issue, we needed to consider two aspects, two sides of the medal, that are the bottom-up and top-down strategies for multi-scale brain modeling. It will become clear soon what it means, bottom-up and top-down. Um, to give you a flavor of the importance of the issue, uh, I just show in this slide a um, couple of initiatives that are now running uh, at the European level. Uh, one is the Human Brain Project that I already mentioned. Uh, that's the leading uh, project for uh, brain research and modeling in Europe uh, uh, over the current 10 years, will last in one year and a half. Uh, then we have three new projects uh, that are uh, enforcing the concept of neuro twins or brain twins digital reconstruction of the brain that uh, um, leverage on the data coming from advanced uh, uh, imaging techniques and uh, investigation techniques of the living brain. They leverage also on cellular neurophysiology, but eventually they generate models of the brain that, that can be used as digital twins or counterparts of the brain of a single person. You can imagine the implications that this can have in terms of uh, neurological uh, sciences and biomedical applications. Um, but in order to put uh, the story on a logical ground, we needed to start with the big questions that animate uh, the research in the field. And the big questions can be summarized in the when, what, and how the brain work. Uh, when the brain is activated, in which part it is activated during a certain task, what the brain is computing and how the brain operates. These are the big questions that we have to anticipate in order to try to explain how the brain contributes to motor control, higher brain functions, and ultimately to use this knowledge in medicine and ICT. Um, at the basis of the story is the multi-scale organization of the brain. Um, it is... Uh, made of uh, molecules, membranes, neurons, synapses at the micro scale. Then we have uh, uh, ensembles of neurons that set up neural networks. And finally, we have larger scale networks in which many microcircuits are connected together. And this is the brain. And correspondingly, there are different ways of measuring what the neurons, the multiplicity of neurons, or the area of the brains are doing. We'll go through this in uh, part in my presentation, but also in the presentations that will follow. So um, this is an example of what we can learn about the brain. This is an example of connectome uh, between the two parts of the brain, uh, quite far apart one from each other, are the cerebellum that is at the bottom and the cerebral cortex at top. Um, the connectome can be reconstructed using uh, MRI techniques, magnetic resonance imaging techniques, uh, based on diffusion imaging. Um, another way to understand the brain is to uh, use uh, functional connectivity uh, techniques. 
uh, based on the bold fMRI effect. And this allowed to generate the task dependent uh, representations of the activity of the brain, but also representation of the resting state networks that are recorded when the uh, subject is not engaged in a specific task. Um, this gives us a picture of what are the areas uh, of the brain that activate in a certain condition. They answer the question of the when. Um, the questions of the what and of the how are not so easy to answer. And uh, they require eventually to model the brain. Um, so modeling the brain gives a further insight into the issue. Um, to illustrate the problem, I have uh, drawn this picture in which I uh, highlight uh, what we call the direct problem and the inverse problem. In physics, direct problems and inverse problems are commonly faced. Uh, in these cases, uh, with the direct problem, we have to infer the observed data starting from a multitude of elementary causes. In this example, we have many neurons, and these many neurons contribute to generate the observables. For example, the signals that we can record with a high density electroencephalography setup. Um, the other way is that we have the electroencephalography setup and we measure a lot of traces from the electrodes, but then we wanted to understand what are the elementary causes that generate them. This problem is quite nasty, it's difficult to solve, and it's called as an inverse problem. In clinics, obviously, uh, what is faced normally is the inverse problem, because what we do is to measure the activity of the brain of a subject. We can also generate a reconstruction of the connectome of the subject brain, but then we do not know very much about the neurons, what they are doing, how they are arranged, what are the principles that govern their function in that particular brain. Um, the story has been uh, elaborated over the years, and uh, uh, now we have a sort of scheme that allows us to move inside this uh, uh, sort of forest of uh, um, actions that we have to take to generate models. Um, this uh, uh, light gray box uh, is uh, uh, the box of cellular physiology and cellular modeling. Um, we can take data from several levels of the brain structure and function and come up to, for example, uh, simplified or detailed microcircuit models that you see inside here. These models are not very useful in terms of uh, understanding directly the function of the whole brain, but they can become instrumental if they are inserted into whole brain simulators. Uh, the whole brain simulators are here in the, the dark shaded area. Um, you see the virtual brain models that will be one of the main targets of the uh, uh, presentations today. And these uh, uh, virtual brain models are generated starting from the brain connectome and from uh, the uh, neural masses, which are a compact representation of the activity of multitudes of neurons. Uh, they're quite abstract representations, but they can capture several high level properties of the neuronal mass. These neuronal masses they go into the nodes of the uh, virtual brain, but can be substituted by mean field models, which are a bit more complicated. They also take into account the variability of the response. They are um, statistically more complicated than the neural mass. And they're much closer to the uh, neurons that constitute the network. Or we can also transplant the simplified microcircuit models or spiking neural networks directly into the nodes of the virtual brain. Uh, I will give you a couple of examples of this in the next slides. Um, in this example, you see a neuron uh, model uh, using uh, advanced modeling techniques uh, with uh, uh, the dendrites, the soma, the axon, and this model generates action potentials. It works more, much like a real neuron. And for this reason, we call this kind of modeling realistic modeling. When many of these neurons are uh, connected together through synapses, uh, uh, the result is this kind of uh, uh, representation on the right. And this representation on the right is a microcircuit. 
this micro series can be made uh, of uh, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of neurons. But since the representation is very low level, is based in ionic channels, membranes, receptors, uh, and uh, new single cell mechanisms, it is still at the micro level. So it is a microscopic model, even if it is big. Uh, the, the grain of the model is very, very low, is a low level model. Okay, in both cases, we have a way to uh, understand and, and counter test the properties of the model using recordings in single neurons or in multitudes of neurons, as shown in the bottom line. Okay, this is the world, the micro world of the neurons and the micro circuits. Um, now, uh, we move a bit higher. The network that you have seen in the previous slide can be simplified. For example, uh, bottom left, this is a simplification using what we call uh, single point neurons. Um, and this simplification maintains, retains most of the important properties of a real network. This spiking neural network simplified can be inserted or implanted or embedded into a virtual brain, like in the top right uh, picture, or in a robotic controller, like in the bottom right picture. So basically we can transfer biology through several modeling steps into the virtual brains and into the robotic controllers, obtaining a representation of the multitude of neuronal activities that are generating the ensemble activity of the system. So basically we're playing with the direct the inverse problem. And we're trying to reconnect and mix them up in order to understand how the brain actually works. Um, an important point is here, and this is I'm close to the end of my introduction, uh, is what will be discussed today um, is the virtual brain model. This virtual brain model is uh, generated uh, with MRI data that are the basis for the empirical uh, structural connectivity matrix, and also the basis for the empirical functional connectivity matrix. Um, the structural connectivity matrix is uh, the starting element to build up the connectome. The connectome is remapped in a 3D space, the space of a virtual brain, actually, it is remapped into this 3D space, which is parcelated into each parcel that is relevant to our simulation. Then to our model, we put a node. There can be hundreds of nodes, depending on the grain of the virtual brain model. This is something that uh, the speakers will explain better. And in each one of these, we can have neuronal masses, mean field models, or spiking neural networks. Once this model is uh, uh, set up, it can be used for simulations. The simulations generate a simulated neural activity. And this simulated neural activity can be recompacted into a simulated functional connectivity matrix. Now we have a functional connectivity matrix simulated and one empirical. The two matrices can be compared. We can extract a parameter that tells us how well they compare one to each other. And then the model can be optimized through several iterations in order to match in the best way the empirical connectivity matrix. What are the parameters that are extracted? The parameters that are extracted are, for example, the global coupling, which indicates the global connectivity of the brain, the local coupling, which is the coupling inside the subnetwork of the brain, the local neuronal activity, which means the intensity of firing in a certain uh, region, and the local excitatory inhibitory balance, a very important parameter. So depending on the neural mass, one can have these parameters or other parameters. And uh, these parameters can be taken globally or also individually in some specific nodes. And this is the knowledge that we gain about the system by looking at the ensemble signals and uh, uh, trying to understand what are the hidden causes that generate the activity of the system. This is a dynamic model. So we are working with neuronal dynamics or brain dynamics, starting from brain structure and brain function. 
So the triad the structure, function, and dynamics is summarized into this kind of models. Um, clearly, before coming to this, we need an infrastructure, we need the modeling workflows, we need uh, uh, atlases of the brain, uh, we need the data repositories, and, and all these kind of things have been constructed during the last years and have been coordinated into a framework that now is uh, uh, being managed and developed by eBrains. Uh, we have a, a system for uh, brain modeling and simulation that leverage on uh, uh, high performance and neuromorphic computing platforms, on a system for storing the data, on brain atlases and so forth. And eventually eBrains is generating a system made of hubs in which these central facilities or core facilities are distributed and used by several hubs uh, working in uh, several European laboratories. Um, my story stops here and uh, it was designed to introduce the uh, presentations from the speakers. Um, clearly, I have to thank all people working in my laboratory that are listed here in the laboratory of neurophysiology, neurocomputation, and brain modeling, and all the collaborators. And among the collaborators, I have to uh, indicate Victor Girsa from the CNRS in Aix Marseille, uh, from which uh, the speakers are coming. Um, I stop here, so please, if you have questions for me, just uh, write them down, put them in the question and answer um, box of your um, Zoom. Uh, um, and, uh, okay, I pass the word to Borana. And please, Borana, take the screen sharing and do your presentation. Thank you, okay. Uh, so, Thank you, everyone. So I'm very excited to talk to you about today about the virtual epileptic patient. Um, so first of all, we have to talk about the main subject here that is epilepsy. Uh, it's one of the most common neurological disorders, uh, one of the uh, most prevalent ones because it affects 1% of the world's population. Um, it consists of recurrent unprovoked seizures which can have different frequencies for some patients. They can have a few seizures per year. Others can have a few seizures per day. So it can uh, have a, a lot of variability. Even the symptoms can be very different. They can go unt uh, until a loss of consciousness. Um, the causes of epilepsy are also um, very, very hard to determine and they can have many different causes. In any case, for two thirds of epileptic patients, um, drug, uh, uh, so anti-epileptic drugs are uh, a possible treatment for them, which work quite, quite nicely. However, one in three epileptic patients is resistant to these medications. And this is the type of epilepsy we're addressing here. For these patients, um, brain surgery is the possible treatment. But prior to brain surgery, these patients, they undergo, first of all, um, uh, uninvasive tests. They can, uh, so clinicians will look at their symptoms. They will look at non-invasive brain imaging data. But also uh, prior to surgery, uh, minimally invasive electrodes, which are called SEG electrodes or stereotactic EEG electrodes are implanted into the patient's brain because they allow a very focal um, uh, recording of the activity uh, in the vicinity of, of that zone, so in a radius of less than two millimeters, and they can go deep in the brain. So here in the middle, I'm showing you uh, an example of what an SCG recording uh, looks like with the seizure onset and offset that is marked by the clinician. You see that a seizure is, first of all, an abnormal electrical activity of the brain. It's highly synchronized. So you can see this offset uh, period is highly synchronized. And also, well, it causes uh, symptoms that are unpleasant to the patient. However, after surgical resection, after the, the, the clinician has um, made a decision, has looked at, at this data, um, only about 50% of these patients are seizure free. So it means that there's another 50% of these patients that still will continue to be epileptic. And this is where the virtual epileptic patient pipeline wants to enter and wants to help these clinicians into better diagnosing uh, the epileptogenic zone. So the regions of the brain which are responsible for the seizure onset. And as a GDO very, very nicely explained, 
Um, here we use uh, multiple brain imaging modalities, mainly uh, MRI, which can be T1 MRI and diffusive MRI, uh, an atlas, a CT scan. So we integrate all of these into a virtual brain model. And just like Adelio explained, we represent the brain regions by network nodes and we connect them together through the tractography we get from the diffusive MRI. We also locate the SEG electrodes taken from uh, the CT scan and also uh, what these SEG electrodes are recording, we take it from the SEG recording. Now, what Egidio also explained is that in every model, in every uh, single node, we will put a mathematical model, which will then allow us to run many simulations. The mathematical model employed here is the epileptor. The strong point of the epileptor is that it can mimic seizure dynamics. So as you can see in the empirical data, this is a seizure-like event from the hippocampus in vitro. And in blue, this is a recording from a population of neurons. As you can see here in the middle, we have, uh, this is a direct DC recording. So uh, it is characterized, the seizure, by a jump in the baseline and then this high frequency activity um, that is, well, quite visible to the eye. There are also some other variables. Here we show uh, oxygen levels or NADH, which is related to ATP consumption. So these variables also evolve in time and they also affect this occurrence of the seizure here. And the epileptor also mimics these kinds of dynamics. So it has a slow variable in red here, which guides the system in and out of a seizure, but also this line in blue here, it's the population dynamics that will be either in the interictal state, so inter-seizure state, or in the seizure state, characterized by a very fast baseline jump, and then this high frequency spike in wave and fast discharges. However, um, in order to optimize our pipeline and to estimate the epileptogenic zone in a very fast manner, what we do is that we keep what is most essential in the model. And for us, it's this slow variable that we keep. And then we simplify our model into only two dimensions by keeping either um, a resting state, a baseline, what we call, or a jump from the baseline. And this baseline jump here will characterize what we call the seizure state. So we will have two different states in, in the epileptor. Why is this important? Because also in the SEG recordings, we can do something similar. We only keep in the SEG recording the part that we care about most, the part prior to starting a seizure, you will be in the baseline. And then when the seizure starts, we will jump from the baseline. When the seizure ends, we go back into the, the, the baseline state. So this will give us this envelope over the SEG recording, which we call data features. And these data features, they look a lot like the time series of the reduced epileptor model. And what is nice about this is that then this reduced model would have fewer parameters to adjust. And just like Egidio said, we can run many, many simulations and we can find the best parameters that could fit to these data features. And once we find that, the parameters will tell us in function of their values, if you're in a seizure region, a region that is seizing, or a region that is not seizing. And this is how we get this EZ estimation, epileptogenic zone estimation. Also, validation is very important. First, we do our validation of this pipeline by using high resolution synthetic data. And this is good because we have the ground truth. Basically, we choose the ground truth. We choose which regions are going to be epileptogenic. We run a simulation with uh, a very high resolution uh, neural field. And then it's what Gidio said, we can map this activity back onto the electrodes by using this forward solution. And this forward solution gives us then um, a synthetic SCG recording that we can give to the VEP module, just like it was if it was a real SCG recording, and we can get the VEP results. And here we get the same regions that we put in the ground truth. And this is a real um, case. This is a 30 year old female patient that is showing seizures in the frontal and orbital, uh, sorry, frontal and temporal region of, of the left hemisphere. And when we run the VEP fitting module, we get basically uh, these three regions. But so how is the VEP performing? Um, the VEP is part of a clinical uh, trial that is uh, four years, but it's still, in, uh, it's still ongoing. We have about 400 patients included, however, uh, so far, the preliminary results, we can show about 25 patients that have undergone brain surgery, 
And out of these 25 patients, 12 of them are seizure free and 13 of them are not seizure free. So this it's the success rate of about 50% I told you about. Now, the interesting part about this is that we can compare the results of the VP for these patients and the resected regions that the surgeon finally decided to remove. And the interesting part is here where uh, we can see this FTR rate. So we compare how many false positives BEP got compared to the resected regions. And what is interesting is that in the case when the patients were seizure free after brain surgery, VEP seems to agree to the result. Almost, it's almost identical. But in the case when the, the outcome of the brain surgery was not successful, the patients were not seizure free, VEP didn't agree with the results of, uh, of the resected region. This is quite preliminary. And I think we should, of course, we should wait up, uh, for the end of the clinical trial, but this is a very positive uh, sign to show us that VEP has a predictive power that could be useful to help the clinician in the diagnosis of this disease. Um, and I would like to thank you for your time. And I would like to thank the whole team of scientists and clinicians that are working uh, on this. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you, Borana, for the very uh, clear presentation. And uh, again, I remind uh, all the audience to uh, keep uh, track, keep record of the questions that you would like to pose to Borana uh, and write them on the question and answer uh, box. And uh, now we move to uh, the next presentation from uh, Pierpaolo Sorrentino. Please, Pierpaolo. There you go. All right. So thank you very much. So uh, basically, I try to um, take on from uh, where Barana um, left. So basically, what Barana showed us is that in epilepsy, you have a certain event which is clearly identifiable in the data which is the seizure. This, I mean, roughly speaking, is something that starts somewhere, right? And then it can spread over neighboring regions or other regions and recruit them in the process. Now, if you think about it, when you, when you do modeling in this case, the seizure, the neurophysiological uh, seizure provides you with a very clear, very um, identifiable correlate, neurophysiological correlate that you can model. This is what you want to imitate if you wish with the model. This is the event that you want to understand the mechanism. However, the idea that somehow activity spreads across the brain should somehow not be limited to epilepsy. After all, uh, for whatever complex behavior we have, we expect regions to interact. We expect their activation, their interchange to succeed with specific sequence in space and in time. But in some sense, we do lack uh, an equivalent neurophysiological correlate for say the resting state or for diseases that are not ictal in nature. So when you don't have such a clear event, as the, uh, the, the epileptic seizure. So uh, in this um, presentation, I will try to uh, show how we can somehow find something similar for resting state. So this is, uh, I slowed down for you one second of activity of a real human brain. This is source reconstructed magnetoencephalography data. And you can see that the activity really does spread. So when it becomes brighter, you see that regions do activate. And this activity is not a random noise. It actually does spread with a very complicated uh, shape, if you wish. For a start, it doesn't feel right to uh, intuitively even to average across this, uh, all this time, right? So how to make sense? So these data that I showed were acquired in the magnetoencephalography um, facility in Naples. And we, um, we basically need to find a way to really listen to the data, listen to this complexity and capture it. Otherwise, we don't even have uh, observable dynamic um, uh, that we can then model. So to, to try to make sense of that complex activity, we borrow from statistical mechanics, the concept of neuronal avalanches. 
uh, naively, we defined an avalanche as starting when one region gets activated. This means that I have a region of the brain, the region is doing whatever, we measure it, but every once in a while, this region activates a little bit more than what's to be expected, what's its normal activity, right? When one region like that act, uh, is active, we say that an avalanche starts, then the avalanche will do whatever it will do, the data will tell us, and then when no region is active any longer, the avalanche will be finished. Now, I really like this slide because we just somehow shut up and listen to the data. What I have done, this is real data source reconstructed. Each, uh, uh, so the X axis is time, the Y axis is a region. So each line is the activity of the region and it's in blue if the activity is below a certain threshold. That's core equal three in this case and it's in red otherwise. And you see how these vertical lines appear. This is highly non-trivial. I never asked the data to do that. The data is simply showing me that. And if I try to, um, to um, look into one of these vertical lines, right? Like as the one which is in the box, what's really showing me is that when active above a certain threshold, then these activities spread, it spreads some more, and then it fades away. Now, the question is biologically, why if, a region, if this region gets activated, why did it go here, the activation, and not here or here or here? What are the elements that are really driving these waves of activation, this burst of activation? Because if we have that, then we are really measuring the dynamics as it unfolds over time, not averaged. So to try to capture this, I made this, um, uh, this well, simple uh, idealized model where basically you have, this is a toy avalanche. Here is time and here is brain region. And you have the region I is active and is active for three time points. But region J only follows in two time points. So of the three time points, region I is active for twice region J followed. So in this matrix, the two third would be the entry. The probability that J gets recruited given high has been stimulated. And I can do this for each avalanche. And you saw the data, there's plenty of avalanches. They're very short, but uh, there's many. And if I average over all the avalanches, I get a matrix such as this. And this matrix, uh, really resemble the structural bundles that I have obtained with, with I can, which I can obtain with DTI. So really I have find a way to measure in a purely data driven way to link the, 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 the shape, the topology, if you wish, of the white bundles connections that link gray regions, gray matter regions, and how the evolution of the signal spread on the large scale. Not only that, I can also, once a region gets active, I can also count how long it takes another region to follow. If the re this region got above thresholds here, then I can count one, two, three, four time points for this other region to also activate. And because I have also the, so I can, so I can obtain this way a matrix of time delays. And because I have the length of the tracks, I can also obtain velocities. So I can have a distribution of the velocity of conduction in the central nervous system, somewhat alike the conduction velocity that has been doing for ages for the peripheral nervous system, but in the central. And this is a personalized feature that I can use and put in the model. Because so far when we model, we just think that if the regions are very far, the propagation will take longer. If the regions are closer, the propagation will take shorter. But really, we know that the property of the tracks do matter. So we try to capture these to make models more personalized. And we went in multiple sclerosis, and we even checked that at the single patient level, the tracks that were lesioned as demonstrated by a structural MRI are also the tracks that are slower at conducting these impulses. Meaning that perhaps we can also try to make this model, bring these models into more diseases. 
Fisher, Fisher direction will then be to somehow link this to real models. Like I'm talking about this uh, spreading of activity, but I'm not really uh, saying what is the mechanism that really drives this spreading. And for this, Giovanni will take on and will talk about how we can model this kind of activity at different time scales uh, so that you get a mechanistic insight on the, on the mechanism. And thank, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Pierpaolo. Uh, the presentation uh, uh, now will continue with uh, uh, Giovanni, Giovanni Rabuffo. Please, Giovanni, share your screen. There we go. Can you see it? Yes. Very good. So, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining this session and thanks for as to the organizers for setting up this webinar series. Uh, in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to introduce you to our recently uh, published work where we investigate on the neuronal mechanisms allowing uh, for the emergence of dynamic resting state networks. In the previous presentation, we have seen that even at rest, when we are not involved in any specific task, uh, the brain's activity is not just noise, but it reveals uh, uh, structural activity patterns. Also, the slow time scale explored by fMRI patterns do appear. For example, the functional connectivity, also mentioned by Egidio, shows typical patterns of correlation across both signals at distant brain regions. Functional connectivity, however, is not static, but network patterns of correlations evolve in time. Likewise, the topochronic mapping uh, uh, shown by Per Paolo, the functional connectivity and its dynamics uh, can be used as a proxy of brain function and dysfunction. It is not yet clear how billions of fast spiking neurons achieve large scale coordination. And now this is an important question since the observations of patterns alone does not tell us how the brain strays away from a healthy regime. In other words, we need to be able to distinguish between healthy and pathological mechanisms underlying resting state brain dynamics. Of course, a main obstacle for achieving this goal is that detailed recordings of neuronal activity at the whole brain level is an extremely challenging experimental task. In order to get around this problem, we adopted an in silico approach where we simulated neuronal activity and studied uh, what kind of processes can happen on a realistic connectum. Uh, we model each brain region using a, a next generation neural mass model that describes uh, the average activity of a spiking neural network. At each time, in fact, the different states of the mean field variables, in our case, the average firing rate R and the average membrane potential V of the population, can be mapped to a specific synchronization level of the spiking neurons inside the region. For example, they can spike synchronously or asynchronously. The neural masses are then connected together according, in our case, to the empiric mouse connectome imported from the Allen Institute. Now, tuning the local and global model parameters, we simulated realistic EEG and bold brain signals, allowing us to study the formation of resting state networks and make hypotheses on their uh, neuronal origins. So we started our analysis by studying the simulated bold signals and their correlation patterns. To study the dynamics of functional connectivity, we defined for every network edge, a coactivation signal as the product of uh, both signals at two regions. Now, the carpet plot that is shown on the right uh, reveals the activity of all the network edges together. As you can observe, large scale dynamics is spontaneously organized in bursts of bold coactivations across the brain, similarly to avalanches, if you want but now at a much longer scale. Each burst highlights a specific set of network edges. And notice that in time uh, epochs, uh, in epochs where um, without the burst, the functional connectivity and correlations across regions are weak. 
strong correlation and functional connectivity patterns are observed only in presence of bursts. Now, these coactivation bursts, uh, therefore, are, can be considered as the building blocks of functional connectivity, but also of dynamic functional connectivity. In fact, the same coactivation patterns, this column in the corporate plot, can reoccur in time, which causes the correlation across functional connectivities, which can be separated by tens of seconds. We confirmed all these predictions in the human uh, and mouse fMRI data. Importantly, these modeling uh, results speak clearly in favor of these bursting phenomena having a validity and not just being artifacts or uh, of processing, for example, or, or scanning movement artifacts and so on. Um, next, uh, we focused on the simulated EEG this time uh, to explain how the bold bursts originates at the neuroelectric level. Analyzing the model, we report a mechanism by which a sudden change of synchronization of the neurons inside one brain region triggers a cascade of neuronal reconfigurations across the whole brain. Now, the reorganization of neurons is a stochastic event which occurs each few seconds in specific sites of the connectome. Therefore, neuronal cascades result in infraslow fluctuation, which means slower than 0.5 hertz, propagating across the whole brain. Depending on the ignition site and on the functional state at which the brain is operating, the neuronal cascade spreads through different connectivity patterns. Um, now drawing from the field of criticality, neuronal cascades can be measured as clustering of neuronal avalanches, which as Pierpaolo showed us are faster scale-free event occurring at the millisecond scale. Uh, remarkably, we confirmed the existence of neuronal cascades in empiric human EEG data, meaning uh, that we confirm the fact that neuronal avalanches indeed cluster at specific uh, times at the infraslow pace. Um, so, so far we have shown that both the bold and the EEG activities are characterized by intermittent bursts occurring at infraslow time scale. Finally, we demonstrated that the global signal of neuronal cascades in blue uh, anticipates the bold coactivation signal in green by a few seconds. This effect was predicted in silico and confirmed in empiric EEG fMRI simultaneous acquisitions on humans. Together, these, uh, these findings suggest that the fast microscopic neuronal events can have a driving role in slow resting state network dynamics by triggering a cascades of neuronal reconfigurations, inducing bursts of bold fluctuations, and thus short-lived functional connectivity states. This new mechanism underlying resting state network dynamics highlight, once again, the importance of multi-scale approaches for brain studies, as Egidio reminded us. So to conclude, uh, addressing the main question of this webinar, are brain networks good or are they bad? So all previous presentations, mine included, have shown the utility of networks as a tool to make sense of brain data. In fact, networks provide a helpful perspective on the brain and in general on complex systems. However, network patterns alone don't tell us what the system actually does. And we need to look for causal mechanistic explanations. In other words, we need to identify what kind of processes can have place on the network. Uh, brain function thus can be represented by processes happening on a network. Uh, moreover, we should remember that networks themselves are not static, but they are dynamic, and that network context matters, which means that we must uh, consider the possibility that brain stimulation, seizure propagation, as in the work of Borana, communication across uh, regions, or even cognition might depend on the background brain state. So again, I'm Giovanni Robuffo. The work here presented was performed in collaboration with Jan Fusek uh, under the direction of Christophe Bernard and Victor Yirsa, and now it's published on in Euro. I'd like to thank my colleague at INS Lab in Marseille, as well as the funding agencies that supported the work. So please reach out to me if you have any questions or comments about the project. Thank you. Um, Thank you, thank you, Giovanni, for this uh, last talk that uh, uh, concludes very nicely all the story that was uh, uh, presented uh, uh, previously. Uh, and uh, 
I would open now uh, to the questions. Um, I'm receiving questions already on my question box. And I will start, I will go in order. So um, I will spell out the question. I will address to you all, and in particular, somebody of you will be more centered to the specific questions. And I invite that one of you to answer. So the first is, uh, is brain surgery the only existing treatment for drug-resistant epilepsy? I understand it is more for Borana. Yes, thank you. So um, no, brain surgery is not the only existing treatment. However, it's one of the uh, most established ones uh, for refractory epilepsy. Um, other treatments that are uh, currently still being tested are uh, brain stimulation, but this can be uh, either invasive or non-invasive. You can try uh, many different types of stimulation. There, there is already has been a clinical trial in France, the Santé trial, which tried to stimulate in uh, a subnuclear of the thalamus. And still the, the issue with brain stimulation is that nowadays it's still not uh, effective for all the patients. It's kind of the same issue with brain surgery and mechanisms are still to be understood. And of course, there is still research being done with anti-epileptic drugs, trying to find drugs that uh, work uh, maybe in the future for these patients that are resistant. So yeah, that's what I would say. Yeah, that's uh, uh, um, quite clear. And I, I would continue with Borana because there are another two questions that I understand could be uh, addressed to you. And uh, um, the first is uh, whether this tool, the uh, virtual epileptic patient can be used only in epileptic refractory patients with negative MRI and also what are the future steps and vision for the VEP pipeline? Okay, very nice questions. So um, yes, the VEP pipeline can be used also for non-negative MRI. Um, a part that I didn't have the time to go into is that um, in the process of estimating an epileptogenic zone, we can also bias the estimation algorithm. So we can um, shift its direction. And if we have a non-negative MRI, meaning that there is um, some malformation in a specific region, we can give that as a prior to uh, our estimation so that we can bias the algorithm uh, such that it can, it can search uh, for, for that region also. Um, and for the second question, um, so yeah, the VEP, well, many, many things can be done. Uh, one of the, the main things would be um, you could add more information uh, into the virtual brain model. As I just said, you can use multiple time scales. Here, we are constrained to neural mass models and to 163 neural mass models. But this is quite a big chunk if you consider the entire brain. So you could go in, in a better resolution. You could add more models. Um, you could, um, uh, another, um, another thing is improving the forward solution and the inverse solution. Like Egidio said, that is a very important problem. And um, doing that right actually has a huge impact on the results. Um, and going in, in a better resolution uh, in the virtual brain model actually will also improve the, the inverse solution. Um, and uh, other steps, um, the VP pipeline, once it's over, um, it, I think um, it would also be applied to um, uh, treatments to epilepsy that would be also um, through non-invasive brain stimulation. This is really the, the, in the future, future steps, but um, we would have the hopes that one day all epilepsies would be treated in a non-invasive matter. So we could record the patient non-invasively and we can treat them non-invasively through stimulation. Yeah. Thank you, Borana, for the answers. And I have now yes. a question to Giovanni. So why neuronal avalanches are not homogeneously distributed in time, but instead they, they cluster into neuronal cascades? Uh, thank you. So uh, indeed, this is not known yet. However, um, neuronal avalanches uh, have been uh, discovered, uh, among other things, by looking at criticality in the brain. And criticality means a specific uh, state 
uh, in which you are at a sort of phase transition, like from liquid to um, uh, solid, for example. To, <clears throat> so the point is when you have this kind of transitions, at the, this phase transition, the system shows particular properties. And it is uh, uh, believed by someone, and uh, it, it's actually an active field of research, that also the brain operates between two states and that it transitions between one and the other. So why do they cluster now? So why do avalanche clusters into cascades? One possibility is that simply we are moving around this critical point. We are getting uh, more into liquid or more into solid phase. We are not exactly at the critical point. Uh, if you want to look at it from this perspective. <clears throat> However, we should also remember that these are not so uh, bold coactivations, resting state network dynamics, and cascades are not the only infraslow phenomena happening in the brain. There is, for example, neuromodulation. There are visual inputs. The stomach, for example, sends inputs, uh, electrical inputs, at a, a frequency which is very similar to the peaking frequency of uh, bold signals. So this is um, all to be kept in mind. So the increase in neuronal avalanches at specific time could be because neuromodulation increases excitability at some point in time for several seconds, and then you have this manifestation. Good, interesting perspective. And uh, um, yet another question. Um, well, um, are there any synthetic data on how the bold signal will vary between the hemispheres of brain given there is an even blood supply to both the hemispheres. I'm not sure who, do, who would like to answer that. I have my mic on, I feel on stage. Right. So uh, so uh, if you can please repeat, however, because yeah. I, I would like to, to, yeah. Yeah, it's a bit convoluted in the end. And are there any synthetic data on how the bold signal will vary between the hemispheres of brain given there is an even blood supply to both the hemispheres. All right, so uh, one thing to say is that synthetic models simulate normally, they simulate uh, or uh, electrical activity, for example, and then uh, this electrical activity, which is a uh, high uh, <clears throat> sampling resolution, um, is transformed into bold signal by a, an, another model. It's called balloon Winkestel in our case. So the model itself can change. And if the model changes, depending, for example, on other properties of the brain, for uh, it could be anything, it could be the amount of uh, um, projection from uh, uh, subcortical uh, nuclei, or it could be, for example, cortical thickness that can uh, vary in the, in the cortex. Um, or the amount of whatever. <clears throat> the point is that uh, the bold model could change. In our case, we took it like homogeneous in the brain. The other thing is that inter uh, so uh, variations in the connectome and across the uh, hemispheres appear naturally in our models. As, um, in particular, in the models that I've been doing with the mouse connectome, because the connectivity is not symmetric, like in the DTI case, uh, we have directionality and asymmetry. So this is important. And the result is that not always functional connectivity, sorry, not always um, connectivity patterns between hemispheres are symmetric. And this can change as well. Good. So, um, Next question is, could you reproduce the same in silico results using a different model or a different connectome question mark? So uh, different connectome, uh, yes, we repeated our analysis on human connectome and uh, the principle is the same. So this is important because the model that we used is not that complicated. Um, there are only two variables for describing one region the connections are all excitatory. Before, Egidio, you reminded us that excitation inhibition balance is important. And of course it is important, but the results were predictive, which suggests us that not every communication in the brain has to be ascribed by 
uh, for example, ex excitatory inhibitory oscillations, oscillations due to excitation inhibition, this seem to be a more general process. And in fact, when we cable the same connect the same model on another connectome, we obtain exactly the same results. So this doesn't mean, uh, so these results are not quantitative. They are more qualitative in nature. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, propagation of a cascade triggers a bulk activation that triggers resting state network. We didn't want to fit uh, resting state networks, just wanted to show how they could appear. However, it's important to reach, if you want to, to tend to biological realism, and uh, in fact, uh, uh, we also attempted uh, uh, different network modeling with excitation inhibition balance. Uh, the results look more realistic, but the principle is the same. Bulk activation appear in columns, functional connectivity states, uh, functional connectivity dynamics depend on these bursts. So those principles are general. Um, yeah, but again, uh, we could have used another model, of course. So clearly the question was how much the model is sensitive to the components that you put in the model, no? which means how much the result depends on what you put in your model. Yeah, in our case, um, we had, uh, technically speaking, we have the bistable model means that we had a off state and on state and the dynamic between, uh, like in the case of Borana, there is a simple model that shows down state and up state. So the simple interplay between regions that are jumping uh, creates this kind of networks naturally. Then of course, if you want to have a I don't know, sharp wave ripples uh, and things like this, you want more biologically accurate models if you want to study that. Sure. Right. So now <clears throat> there is a last question uh, on my screen uh, that may be for the three of you. Um, how are you using eBrains in your work? So each one has probably a different use of eBrains. So we can start from, uh, let's say, Borana. Yes. So um... For me, eBrains, this is not immediately related to this project, but it is related to how I generate my synthetic data. Uh, so as I showed uh, the virtual brain model and the model that we use in it, uh, the epilepter is a model that, as I said, can mimic seizure dynamics and it can mimic them so well that um, we can also create, um, let's say digital twins of SEG recordings. So um, uh, in this way, we can take uh, our patient examples and uh, we can build the identical version as best as we can, of course, um, uh, of them uh, virtually. And then all of this synthetic data, I am sharing it on eBrains so that all of the other collaborators and all the people that can be interested can use this synthetic data for their preliminary analysis. Because this is also, um, as I showed in the validation uh, pipeline of the VP, we use high resolution synthetic data because we know the ground truth. We know what is happening because we set up basically the parameters of the model. We know where the seizure starts, where it spreads and how. And by using this kind of approach, it allows us to validate our models and to validate our analysis before we go into the empirical data. So eBrains uh, is, is a structure that allows me to upload my data and then to share it with, with others so far. And for you, Pier Paolo and Giovanni, what's your take on this? Um, well, for me, um, just like um, sometimes, just like Borana, it's uh, it's indirect at this point. And my main concern is that is to somehow provide ways to extract relevant features from the data in an informed way, such that the models can be uh, as realistic as possible. Meaning that. Uh, has been done for a while to, as everyone has showed, to, um, to include the connectome. However, as Giovanni uh, said, the connectome is a backbone over which certain processes occur. Now, these processes eventually, we don't know what they are. We have hints of what they are, which means that we don't exactly know what is the right way to extract information from the data. If we know the process, we know exactly what it should generate in the data, then no problem. But this is not the case because of the inverse problem that was mentioned earlier at the beginning. Yeah. So in that sense, we're trying to, just as in epilepsy, we have the seizure to find features that we can extract 
easily, smoothly from the data and feed them in the model and delays go in that sense. Uh, so in some sense, I would say that my uh, efforts are to personalize the model even more because uh, coupling with the connectome is absolutely necessary, but it's not sufficient. It's not the whole story for all the processes that are occurring. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Pierpaolo. Giovanni, if you want to tell something uh, yeah, so, about that, we have not much time now, but you can tell a few words. Very briefly, uh, very briefly. Um, these models that I uh, was talking about, this next generation Euromass models, uh, now they are implemented, uh, uh, they are uh, uploaded on uh, eBrain's platform on the collaboratory and uh, are use, uh, uh, people can make use of them uh, through the virtual brain. So this is uh, an ongoing operation. So we are keeping uploading models as soon as they come. And uh, again, uh, in the direction of having more realistic models we need this kind of uh, um, upgrade also of the technology of the uh, of the uh, that we are using. And among these upgrades, there is also here in our lab uh, uh, a new direction, which is uh, that of neural fields. Uh, and that's also something that one can find uh, um, uh, will find on eBrain. Uh, and these models will be coupled on a neural field where we don't use a parcellation into a bunch, like a hundred of areas, but uh, way more areas. And, uh, and there we can really make more uh, studies on uh, the propagation of the uh, seizure, like in the case of Borana or avalanches in the case of Pierpaolo, um, on a realistic geometry. And this, in fact, is believed to be important. Like if we want to stimulate, for example, the nor the vector normal to the surface of the brain is important uh, to know because the effect of a stimulation will depend on that angle. So this new geometry will be important. Okay, so thank you very much also for your uh, last viewpoint. So our time is uh, uh, expired and uh, I thank you uh, all of you for the very nice presentation and the discussion. I hope the question on whether the brain as a network is good or bad has uh, received an interesting uh, viewpoint. My impression is good. So also the network in the brain is a good story. And uh, so thank you very much for the participation to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, bye everyone. everyone. Thank you.